Oh Lord, it was just so hard because I had never actually been away from home before. And I just, at, at some point, I just thought we all was gonna die. I mean, it, was, it started getting real sad because I think we all just thought we was never gonna leave there. My name is Gloria Bree Love Westbrook, and I was 12 years old when I was placed in the Leesburg, Georgia Stockade. I came from a poor family. I would mostly use the summer for working, trying to, to get money to prepare for returning to school in the fall. I would usually work the cotton fields, peanut fields to make, make extra money to buy uh, things like undergarments, um, material so that some of my older siblings would make skirts and dresses for me. What really made me really upset was the black and white neighborhoods and how you could just stand on the streets and look like North Lee streets or South. You knew your, that this part wasn't where you could walk. Being born in America's Georgia, there were signs posted on establishments that said white only. And you, you were just born to know to obey these signs. First of all, I noticed these strange people in the neighborhood. And what I mean by strange is they're, uh, the way they look, the way they're, they dressed, and their accent, the way they talk. And just looking at them, I could tell they wasn't from here, from Americas. And the other thing that was peculiar was the fact that some of them was black and white, but they all walked together. They were mingling together. That was something that didn't go on here in Americas. Our initial work was canvassing the streets of Americas, going from door to door uh, with pen and paper, uh, we'd practice our lines at the Snick House in terms of how we would approach people, how we would question them, and, and how we would try and build up that trust to, because people were really afraid to, to, to get out and register to vote. They stood to lose uh, the loss of their jobs and even uh, 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 loss of their lives. I mean, that's just how bad things were at that time. But at the same time, we were raising other issues. Voting was just a f part of the front to talk about other things like sharecropping and slavery that literally existed in the rural areas and we were trying to educate people or encourage them not to have fear and let them know that they were humans and had certain basic human rights. Once students became involved, we'd load up the buses and uh, we'd have these mass meetings out in the country. The mass meetings were similar to church services. We sang the same songs, but we would talk about freedom in the songs. I can remember the speeches and the songs and the, the, the uh, unity and seemed like it was everybody was just on the same accord. Ordinary people like maids, butlers, would get up and testify about their day at work, how they had invaded the lunch counters and did sit-ins and how they were hauled off to jail, beaten. I do remember um, after going a couple times to mass meetings that I was, every time they were, there was one, I was ready to go.
right when I first came here, the little girl Anna B. Hayes was killed by this white man after they had raped her. And she took off and brought her back that evening. She died a day later. And Sheriff Chapel went to the house and slapped a nine-year-old boy to his knees and made him say he didn't see a white man do nothing. And because we started investigating it, and we started putting that word that white people had killed Anna B. Hayes. We took a picture of Anna B. Hayes in her coffin, and I put it in our window. And every day I would talk to Anna B. Hayes and promise her that we were going to find her killer. We were bombarded by uh, state troopers and local police all the time. Um, but they had put four guys in jail uh, and, and put them under, under old statutes that uh, they could have been executed, you know, if they were proven guilty. A young boy was, was, was trampled and stumped by the police, legs broken. Uh, a, a girl had just got raped by a white man who didn't spend one day in jail. Oh, this was a crescendo. The whole thing happened all at, at the same time. And, and so um, it, it was a crisis situation. And all of our guys had to come to America's. It was uh, July 1963. We had planned to protest against the Martin Theater, the only theater in America's Georgia, but the blacks was designated to go around the back, through the side door up to the balcony. So we had planned to go there and go through the front door, not up to the balcony. When we sung the song, We Shall Overcome, different verses were put inside that song and people grew militant and anxious. Within that song, we put a verse and we shall go downtown at that verse that came out of the church and spontaneously start marching on the night demonstration. We were all marched as a group. And whenever we were ordered to disperse, we all would sing a song together and kneel and pray. Those were our only weapons. Some snitch must have already um, informed the white folks and the Ku Klux Klansmen because when we got there, they met us there. They were already there. That was this barrage of state troopers and self-appointed guardians, some of them Ku Klux Klan members. There was troopers with their hoses and their clubs and their dogs, their guns and their electric pardon irons that they would use on cattle, and they would use them on black kids. They gave guns to ordinary citizens who wanted to help to keep people from demonstrating. We were attacked by just ordinary white citizens on the street. They ordered us to disperse. I heard that again, for us to disperse or we would go to jail. I remember seconds, within seconds, it was like pandemonium, you know. And uh, I remember being hit over the head with the billy club and I remember dogs nipping at me and being holes down. And at that moment, I lost my shoes. My shoes were swept away because the force from the fire hose would take this can off you and it would knock you down and it would roll you over and over. So when you have a whole lot of people around you, you're struggling to try to keep on your feet. And it was just pandemonium. I heard gunfire. People were screaming. and It was a very bloody scene on Cotton Avenue. And they bloodied the kids. and. Uh, gathered them up and threw them in garbage trucks and carried them away to different jails or uh, to the camps that they put them in. The paddy wagons drove up and the, I mean it was just the same old song because we had been doing this most of the summers and they put us in the back of the paddy wagons, scrunched us all up in there and I can't even remember how many people it was just packed. Somebody grabbed me and just swung me in the wagon. It was so hot and so jam packed in there. I could barely breathe, and uh, I, I don't know if I passed out or something, but when I came to myself, we were, we were all stuffed in the America's something kind of jail. They held us there all that day without a phone call, without visitation or food or anything. 
or even reading us our rights. We fill the jails and then they would borrow the jails of surrounding counties. Older people would think that the worst thing in the world is to have a child in jail. We didn't think like that. We, uh, our thing was to put them in jail, put as many in jail as we could get, give them as much trouble, load them up with folk, and hopefully they would let everybody out. At first we were really happy because we thought we were going home. We got in the paddy wagon, we were really happy. We were singing and just having a good time. Finally we realized by peeping out the holes in the paddy wagon that we were not on our way to America. They took us to this building. It was an abandoned stockade building. Uh, had been used since the Civil War. We went in the back door. It had bars on the door and the windows and broken glass in the windows. And we were pushed and shoved in there, pushed to the floor. And it was like a, a small like room. And there was a very dingy light hanging down from a chain uh, that gave a uh, very dim light to the hard concrete floor that was, uh, I had a lot of debris on it, not from who knows when. It had open shower stalls around the room, but they didn't work. Just one of them was leaking a little warm water. They had a toilet there that didn't work. The toilets were not working. The toilet did not work. It was just there. And of course, that's all we had to use. I mean, just feces and everything all over everywhere, you know, just, just everywhere. It was filthy. It was filthy. And I think um, one of the things that I remember the most is the smell. The first day, we were still fired up. We kept singing the freedom songs and kept praying. Of course, that day, we had no food or visitation or anything. And the second day, the guard there brought a box of hamburgers that were rare. It was cold and hard on a hard bun and they were rare. At first, you didn't want it, you, got, you know, because you weren't that hungry. Two or three days with no food and you go, uh... Other than that, we, know, we really didn't have water. We didn't have anything to drink. They never brought us anything to drink. So we were drinking water that we could put in our hands and cup. And of course your hands weren't that clean. I mean, you must think about it. They didn't give us nothing to bathe with, nothing to wash our hands with, nothing to do anything with. We had no way of cleaning ourselves. We had no toothbrush, no toothpaste, no soap, none of these things that women, you know, people need for hygiene. The cockroaches would be in there because, you know, the waste and the heat, you know, and in the South during those times, the summers, the temperature get up to 100. Uh, more. Gigantic spider webs and big flying roaches, rats. There were no beds or bumps there. The mattresses uh, had such a stench to them. Uh, in fact, we would start pulling some of the mattresses off and using them to absorb some of the urine and, and, and whatever that we had to. Maybe gave us a blanket somewhere later on and it had cigarette burn holes in it or something, but we were on this floor for 45 days. Each day we would sing the freedom songs and pray. But as the days went on, every once in a while, you know, we would put on talent shows, some girls sing or dance or whatever their talent were, just to keep our spirits up. We would reminisce about what our grandmother, our aunt would cook. Uh, we talk about pound cakes, uh, our favorite food, chicken or greens. When I get out, I'm going to take a bath and I'm going to curl my hair. When I get out, I'm going to ask my mom to make me some biscuits. Some of the girls wouldn't feel that well, would get sick. And we kind of knew that we had to bolster each other. Eventually, some of us started having diarrhea from the rare meat. Some of the girls was on their monthly and we were taking our brats apart, trying to protect them. and. Um, 
So you would take the rags apart so they could use that? Some of it, yeah. And eventually I ended up with nothing on because I, I, that potato sack that I found in the corner, because I was trying to nurse my wound yeah. and trying to help protect someone else, phys you know, uh, as far as the hygiene. And uh, some, of the, some of us were vomiting. We had ear aches, we felt filled with mucus. We would sit around in a circle and hold each other's hands. We would pray, a lot of us, you know, all of us, we were Christian girls come from a Christian home. We would tell stories, we would tell jokes. I mean, anything that we could do to pass the time away. But as the days went on, sometimes the room would grow silent. There would be bouts of crying. Uh, people, some girls would be saying, I want to go home. When are we ever going to get out of here? It began to get scary. We were, of course, frightened because the jailers were very aggressive. Uh, they were constantly taunting us if someone was sick or everything was a joke. And I can remember um, that um, these white men would come up and they would say all kinds of horrible things. The typical, you know, nigga, bitch. Um, Wenches and uh, jungle bunnies and we were stupid. And what made you think that you can go above the law? Sometimes the police would come in and rape girls and just bring, take them out at random, or bring them back and just throw them in the cell like a, just throw them down like a sack of potatoes. They did not see us as children. They did not see us as women or female. Um, all they saw was the color of our skin and there was just no regard for any humanity at all. Our tears didn't mean anything. You know, we were young, we were crying, I want my mama kind of thing. There was no pity. There was no interest, no, you know, it's gonna be all right, or, you know, they're gonna, don't worry, we're not gonna let anything happen to you. It was just the opposite. There was a perverse joy in seeing us uh, break. I don't know who at first said, there's a snake in here, look, look, there's a snake. And we all were screaming and hoovering around together and running as a unit from one side of the cell to the other. And we screamed and yelled and screamed and yelled. He opened the door and I remember him hollering, run, and run. And somebody said, don't run, don't run. He just give him a reason to shoot you. One of the girls was just so terrified, she couldn't go back in. So to keep him from shooting her, we all, some got in the front and some in the back, and we shoved her in back in. And she would like wake up at night having these nightmares, yelling and screaming and saying that the snake was there. And we would all just put her in a circle on the floor and take turns telling her that the snake wasn't there until she would fall back to sleep. There was a man by the name of Story, Mr. Story, who was the town's dog catcher. He was a white man. And he was the one responsible for taking the, the food out to the girls in the stockade, the hamburgers, the four hamburgers a day. And uh, he would actually get messages from some of the kids. This is how some of the parents found out where they were housed in jail. I would cry at night and just be, couldn't rest, just couldn't rest. I had lost a lot of weight and just couldn't, just couldn't hardly take it. That's all. I just couldn't take it hardly. And my my dad had certainly didn't. He had a hard time about it because she was the only. Cause she was a girl, and uh, he just triggered. She just didn't. Have, he begged her not to go that afternoon. Don't go, Emery. Don't go. And he walked up. When he, when he got up there where they were demonstrating, he uh, he saw them take off and he almost cried. He said, oh Lord, they got my baby. 
<laughs> Stick was very much working with C.B. King and other attorneys to try and, and, uh, and to get their release. I just heard everybody said that someone was out there and I just, I woke up and I went to the bars to, to look out. And um, I saw him, you know, I saw this uh, white man with a camera on his shoulder and he was saying, he was telling us to be quiet. And he just said, girls, look up at me. I can remember him saying, telling me, look at me. And he said, they're going to get you out. And he was trying to be very confident. And he asked some of the girls to go up to the, the, the other end of the jail cell so they could distract the guard. I guess we just thought that, oh, well, he, this man came and took pictures. I hope a leaving had died. About a week or so later, his pictures got us out of there because they had got in the hands of a congressman and went before the congressional committee. And we found out later that President John F. Kennedy federalized National Guards to come down and police and open up these cells. Later, I found out that there was a fine so much a day that they fined our parents to get us out. Uh, some of the parents didn't have the money, and by court order, I think, they ended up getting the rest of the children out. And the day we was taken out, it was the afternoon. It was a beautiful day, I remember, because it was in the month of September, and weather was beautiful. Uh, my school had begun, like I said, but I was in no condition, really, to uh, just go <clears throat> right in the, anywhere. We had to go to school that next day. And, you know, and having been out for that length of time, that was one of the things that the judge told us, that we had to be in school the next day. You know, I was weak, I was suffering, I had earaches, I was, um, needed doctor attention, mm -hmm. I had lost 10 pounds, I was um, traumatized. I, uh, it was like the, the sun would even hurt my eyes. I remember I lay down on the couch in my grandmother's house and I slept for 24 hours. And uh, when I woke up, I didn't know what day it was. I was eating everything I could find. I was just going around eating whatever I could find, because I was really hungry. When I got home, the first thing that I told my mom was that I didn't have a cycle. And, uh, and that's why I say, I guess, we needed counseling and didn't realize that we needed it. Because, you know, I, and my mom had explained to me how you have babies and how you get pregnant, but you know, that whole month I was so scared I didn't know what to do because I didn't know whether somebody had done something. And um, I I took a bath, but I tell you, for months I can smell the stench of that place on me. Sometimes it would make me so sick that I would lose my appetite. And it didn't take much for me to think about it, and I would not want to eat any meat at all. And you, you were kind of glad to get back in your neighborhood and glad to get back with your friends and glad to get back to the dinner table. You know, glad to get a bath, mm -hmm. you know, glad to, to, to just be self again. You know, glad to see some changing clothes, glad, just glad. We should have put our lives on the line. And it's not because we didn't love ourselves. We loved ourselves, and that's what caused us to do it. We just didn't have nothing. And 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 you, you either going to have to get out there and fight the cause and try to get something, or you're going to stay in the same situation you're in. There are a lot of people that live through things that they never recover from, but it made a difference. And that means that they don't have a happy, productive life. It's just that that part of their life left a scar. No change is made. There's no gain, human gain, ever made without somebody sacrificing. And I think I gained more from it than I lost. Um, yes, I, I have bad memories. Um, it was scary. But I am the woman that I am now because of those experiences. I always wonder about how America's never got that, uh, it never made the headlines that a lot of the other cities did, you know. What America's didn't have at the time was it, there was no uh, moment uh, like the bridge at Selma, you know. So a lot of attention, America's didn't get a lot of attention at that time, but the struggle here was just as important. And if we all leave here without putting pen to paper or, or to film or to audio. Um, what happened to us 
and what happened to children across this country will be lost. And our children need to know. I just don't, I have a real terrible time when I come here. Yeah. I'm always upset or I'm, I'm nervous. I would want this to be like a museum or a tourist site where people come to see where we was actually held. Mm -hmm. I think that it should it should be it should remain in this condition. I mean, upkept enough, you know, for people to come to see mm -hmm. the place where we were held. I really believe that that should be done. Come on back, let's get out of here. <laughs> Please, sir. Oh, God. You all right? Yep. I started back there when you were talking. I started to feel something. I didn't even stay there. I'm, I'm telling you, it is really, it's really weird. It is hard to explain how just coming back here make you feel. I mean, I, I never imagined that I would be crying now. It's just something, it's a lot of stuff that's suppressed, maybe some of the stuff we don't want to think about. It's just not easy. No. Then you have to remember that this was a place that we never expected, we never expected to leave here alive. All of us girls that really, really accepted the fact that we were going to be the freedom riders to die so that the other ones could have a better chance of survivor. I mean, uh, you know, I, I have a daughter and I, I, you know, thinking about that, that you all at 12 had decided that if death, that you, if it was going to be death, then it was going to be death. That young, how do you be so? But Sherry, if you live in a place where you walk out your door and nobody have to speak a word, but every sign that's posted, you have been taught by birth to follow that sign. If you live in a condition where every time you walked on a certain side of the town, or on the, a certain side of the street, that you had to be careful and not to forget to keep a straight path to a certain way because you were black and you wasn't allowed to go there because of your skin color. Uh, no matter how smart you were, or how you educated yourself, you were never gonna be able to have a job, except a menial job. And this is the way it was gonna be for the rest of your life. Then either you would take another attorney to get out of that situation, or you already did, Sherry, because you couldn't go any farther. So once I understood that, even at 12, 11, and 12 years old, it, I, I determined either I was going to join the protest, do it non-violently as I was taught, or this would be my life for the rest of my life, that there's a sign that says white only, and I know to obey it. And then my children would know to obey it, and their children would know somebody had to stop it. And I was chosen to be one of them to stop it.